Good afternoon, everybody, from the O2 Arena in London. A Sunday boxing special coming up live on the zone around the world. Nine fights on the bill, topped by Lawrence Acoli making the second defence of his WBO Cruiserweight world title against the dangerous Michał Cieslak from Poland. Joining myself, Darren Barker, at the commentary desk with three of the fights for you on Before the Bell, as well as the Welsh wizard, Joe Cordina. Great to have you with us, lads, as always. There are the three that are coming up for us. Big Dempsey McKean from Australia takes on... Argentina's Ariel Esteban Bracamonte, eight rounds heavyweight action. Then John Hedges returns on a mark to his fighters against Alexander Nagolsky. Then Big Chef Clark makes his debut, Tokyo Olympian against Tony Vishic. And that will take us through to around 5 p.m. where we'll be live on platform. Campbell Hatton against Joe Ducker, his return after five fights in nine months last year. Then Big Fabio Wardley makes his return after nine months out with a few injuries to heal against Big Daniel Martz from the United States. Anthony Fowler makes his middleweight debut against Lukas Maciek from Poland. And then a big opportunity for featherweight Jordan Gill as he challenges for the European title against the champion Kareem Guerfi. And then the much-awaited debut of one of the most talented amateurs we've seen in recent years, Galau Yathai, the youngest of the three boxing brothers, takes on Carlos Vedo Bautista on his debut in a 10-round contest. That will set the table very, very nicely for the main event here at the O2 Arena. Lawrence Sicoli making the second defence of his WBO World Cruiserweight title against Michal Cizlak. He has ambitions of facing Myris Bredis in a unification later on. Myris Bredis will be part of our broadcast team here tonight. Will we have news for you later on? A Coley cannot afford to slip up. There are the three of us there. Evening, lads. Joe Cordine is on his phone. That's absolutely fine. Give the viewers at home a wave. He's uh, he's hoping to get hired again. I'm not sure he will after that. Uh, Joe, good to see you. Obviously, you've had um, a, a few months off now. You've been back in the gym now. And I know Dempsey McKean has, has joined your stable. How's he been fitting in with the lads? Yeah, um, he's, since he came over, he's uh, been doing great. Um, he's been in the gym training with Tony. Um, I haven't seen him spar yet because they've been going out and um, getting some top-level sparring, which is uh, which is good for him. But um, yeah, uh, he's doing really well. He's keeping up with the runs. That's the main thing. But well, you, you've thing. done no sparring with Dempsey. No, I'd smash, I'd smash him the bits. Smash his kneecaps the bits, maybe. Uh, well, anyway, the guys are ready to ring walk for the first uh, of our contest this afternoon. So we'll hand you over to our MC, Mr. Joe Martinez. Check, check, check. I don't have. I have no sound. I have no sound in the house. Check. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Welcome to the O2 Arena here in London, England, for an exciting night of professional boxing. All brought to you by Eddie Hearn for Matchroom Boxing. Sponsored by Bet Fran, Well Hydrate, and JDSports.com. And we're set to go with this match of eight rounds in the heavyweight division. First to make his way to the ring, fighting out of the red corner from Argentina, Ariel Bracamonte. in this very arena in 2018. He's heavy-handed, he's dense, but he's wild and could be open as well. And Alex tipped the scales at a huge 296 pounds yesterday. You can't help but think that whatever speed he does have isn't likely to last long in this fight. And will he be mobile enough to close the gap if it's a very tall and mobile heavyweight like Dempsey McKean? That could be a difficult task to him. He needs to drag the Aussie into a dogfight this evening and therein lies his best chance of victory. And his opponent ready to make his ring walk to the blue corner. The undefeated Australian heavyweight, Dempsey McKean. From Ipswich in Australia, 10,000 miles away, Dempsey McKean has relocated to the UK in recent times. And as I mentioned, been training with Tony and Peter Sims in Essex, both of whom were in his corner with Mark Seltzer tonight. He was originally brought to spar Anthony Joshua a few weeks before the USIC fight done some good rounds with Dillian White and Daniel Dubois too. Made his stateside debut in the second half of 2021. He stopped Don Tainsworth in six in New Hampshire. And he's expected to get the job done well tonight before pushing on later this year towards what he hopes will be a fight with a top 15 world ranked heavyweight. Well, here we go once again, ladies and gentlemen, eight rounds of action. This in the heavyweight division. 
Introducing to you first, fighting out of the red corner. Wearing black trunks, he weighed in 293.1 pounds. In 17 fights, his record stands at 11 victories with six defeats, six wins coming by way of knockout from La Cumbre Cordova, Argentina. Here is Chiquito Ariel Bracamonte. And across the ring, his opponent fighting out of the blue corner. Wearing white, trimmed in gold, he weighed in officially 246.1 pounds. In 20 professional fights, he stands perfect with 20 victories, including 13 big wins coming by way of knockout from Ipswich, Queensland, Australia. Here is the undefeated Dipsy McKee. And your referee in charge of the action and judging the fight, Lee Everett. Okay, lads, when I say stop, you stop boxing. When I say break, take a step back. Keep your hands up, protect yourself all the time. Good luck to you both. Good luck. So eight rounds of heavyweight action to kick us off here at the O2 Arena in London. And Australian boxing in a good place at present. Tim Zhu ranked fifth by... Ring Magazine at 154 pounds. Jeff Fenix, Charles Brock Jarvis is 20 and 0. George Cambosis with one of the performances of the year last year. Sky Nicholson making her debut in San Diego next weekend. Ebony Bridges fighting for a title in five weeks' time. And Dempsey McKean, Darren, is uh, looking a very solid contender at this point in his career. And well, you'd expect him to look good in victory tonight. And if he can do, he should be pushing on to. to uh, slightly different level to this later on this year. Yeah, I'm uh, excited to see him live in the flesh. I've heard good things about him yeah. from what I've seen in the past on YouTube, etc. He's very nimble for a big guy, puts his shots together well, works behind a lovely southpaw jab, as we can see there, varies it up to the body. But his opponent, Bracamonte, he's a, he's a tough, he's a tough mutt. We see him, well, I mean, the, the, the memory I have of Bracamonte is against Dave Allen. He's got caught with a lovely straight left hand from McKean there. And he showed his toughness and heart in that fight, but most of the time when he does lose, he gets stopped. So it'd be uh, down to Dempsey to, to force the action, continue behind that jab and try and detonate that big left hand of his. Joe, of course, you know just, just what it takes to stay in the mix with the lads in Tony Sims' gym. They're, they're some of the best, if not the best conditioned in the country he, he's spoken about how much he's already come on as a fighter just give us an insight as to what, what kind of work you are put through on a weekly basis yeah it's um it's not easy at all uh, i think um well I'm, it's not i think i know there's a lot of fighters have come uh, have come through our doors and they've tried to keep up with honor runs and trying to impress and um they they to be honest they can't hack it but dempsey have uh, slotted right in and he's uh, settled in lovely and um for a big fella, he's very, very, very athletic. He's doing the right thing here, just getting behind that stiff southpaw jab. We know that Bracamonte needs to make this a dogfight, really, as he did against Dave Allen. We know he is heavy-handed, he just misses with a, a right hand there. And he's, well, he's not difficult to, to hit clean, but he is quite difficult to break down. And McKean is going to have to go about this with precision and probably a little bit of patience here. Yeah, I think going wide round the guard would be a, a good option. He keeps his... A really tight high guard but there are gaps around the side of Bracamonte who lets his hands go Stop boxing. A, bit, a bit too much circling of the ring at the minute Dempsey McKean this is where he wants to be hold the center of the ring work behind that jab as he's doing now he's just seen it all before Bracamonte hasn't he he's so experienced he's trying to go wide there there's shots that might find the opening for McKean The conditioning of Bracamonte at a, a career heaviest or thereabouts that will potentially come into question as this fight progresses. And of course, speed would have been power out as part of a game plan to try and close the keen down. And his imperative is, is pretty obvious in that first round, keeping things long, sharp, sharp, long singles. And he landed plenty of them in those first three minutes. Yeah, I think that. I think setting the pace could be crucial for McKean here as well. We can see Bracamonte not in the best condition. So I think trying to set the pace, get behind that jab, put your shots together. Doesn't need to be moving back as much. Just caught with a, a right hand there from Bracamonte, but 
in the hole. Box nicely behind that jab. Just getting a bit wider with the shots. We see him having a bit more success. <laughs> Mark Seltzer on the left of uh, the screen, just applying the, the Vaseline, one of the best cutsmen in the business. Peter Sims, top right, and of course, Tony Sims, who has guided your career down and is guiding yours, Joe, as well. A good man in the corner, not many better. And away we go into the second of eight. Bracamonte, just a stiff jab over the top of McKean's, but the Australian now back and centre ring. Yeah, throwing the jab like he means it as well, really snapping it out. Love the variation of it, that jab and body. He's looking for that wide left hook there. Just overreached with it. Yeah, he got tagged on the return there. Just a little reminder. Dave Allen, of course, well, he, he was a far less elusive target than McKean is, is proven to be in these early stages, but he said, I, can, I can rarely remember being hit harder than he hit me. And I suppose whatever shape he's in, when you have got... 300 pounds turning through the shots you, you are going to feel them in those gloves and i never remember seeing a fight dave allen's face as bad as it was after that fight he was really busted up and mckean really i think he boxes sensibly he can make lighter work of this man but he gets just caught with the right yeah. hand on the counter yeah he's got to set those shots up get behind the jab he was just wild with that hook there i think the jab's key at the minute variation with it try and break bracamonte down with the shot Body shots as well. I think tapping upstairs, dropping downstairs. You can see, like I touched on before, there, there are heavyweights out there in better shape. That was a good short left hook. Do you see Peter Sims there just saying, what's the backhand coming over? He just comes around the side with that, and it, it's a weighty punch, and it's wild, but you don't want to get caught with it flush. Good spell from McKean, though. <laughs> He's adjusted though, Bracamonte. He just threw a left hook, Dempsey McKean, and he managed to get the, the backhand to cover the shot. Bracamonte he's fired back with his own right hook. Although he's winning the exchanges, Joe, you, you will be feeling the kind of physical presence and, and the weight of, of Bracamonte. He's constantly just inching forwards. Yeah, I think I think Bracamonte is just waiting for him to um, let his hands go and trying to catch him with a, um, a wild counter. But I think Dempsey's boxing lovely. Um, them right hooks from the from the side, I think, are working. And as long as he just keeps it long and uh, on the ones and twos, I think uh, there'll be a, a short night work, um, short nights work for him. Dillian White bought him over in preparation originally for for Otto Vorlin, but I dare say he would be not bad preparation for for Tyson Fury in the sense that they're around the same height. And Fury, of course, does switch hit, and you never really know what he's going to do. It wouldn't be a bad option to just have. Some, some southpaw sparring in the bank with someone of, of the kind of height and reach that he has in preparation for what is undoubtedly the biggest fight of White's career in a few weeks' time at Sir Wembley Stadium. But good work from McKean, and he's attested to he's never had as much sparring as this last six months in his whole career, and that he really feels it has brought him on to no end. Just not as much high-quality sparring in the Southern Hemisphere that there is across Europe. Now. Yeah, and you can see there exactly what Joe said. He's looking for the one shot every time Dempsey McKean lets his shots go. He's trying to look for that big overhand right. He missed with a couple there, but showing what a tough customer he is. Always trying to walk forward, always closing the ring down. There's that big overhand right Joe touched on. But that was good counter punching from Dempsey McKean. Fired back with three unanswered shots. Big deep breath from Rafa Monte afterwards. That's the shot there. He was just leaning back on it slightly, just taking a bit of the power away on that shot but followed it up with a nice straight left down the middle of the guard of Bracamonte. Tony have any heavyweights when you were in the, the gym, Darren? Early, early on there was Mark Potter, he was sort of uh, coming to the end of his career. Uh, was he a Repton boy? Mark Potter wasn't, I think it was West Ham. Uh, and there was Andrew Lowe, light heavyweight, there was a few in there. Tony used to throw me in with him and I used to run. <laughs> but I heard Tony in the corner there just saying, stop getting backed up. 
leaning back on the ropes. Tony does like you to circle the ring and get back to the center of the ring. Always try and urge fighters to do that. Don't want to be spending too much time and energy moving around the outskirts of the ring. This is where he wants to be, standing his, letting go of those lovely crisp jabs, followed up by the straight left hand. This is better work. Head hunting a bit, just needs to drop down to the body afterwards. Starting to sit down on yeah, those shots, nice straight shots too. Oh, Pieces together, lovely. Side. Yeah, it was lovely, wasn't it? He had a one-two left hook. It was a lovely combination. Managed to get that hook round the guard. I think that's the, the key to success. Drop down to the body afterwards as well. See Bracamonte still looking for that one shot that Joe pointed out. Really yeah. Starting to see that wild right coming now, slipping outside of it, and he just coming back with his own counters. Looking in control. Looking like he's just taking control of the tempo of the contest, Emerson McKean. Looking comfortable on the back foot. Yeah, there's a lovely long right hook to the body there as well. Starting to mix it up a bit with the hooks. Dropping down low. Then you can work back upstairs. Just struggling with a southpaw stance, Bracamonte. He, he, he can't get his jab off, and you're trying to load up with that right hand. But obviously, you, you've got a better chance of landing with the backhand when you, you set it up with a jab. So he's missing an awful lot. It's a good little spell behind the jab from McKean. Oh, a lovely left hook. Great shot. Just punched at the same time, but McKean got there first. Left handers. Bracamonte is looking to pull the, the trigger on the right. And just turned his head, but he's got a solid chin. And now McKean has just turned in with his back to the ropes right at the end of the round. Most meaningful shot of the contest so far from Dempsey McKean. Bracamonte starting to slow as we expected that he may do. And he looks uh, well in control at this stage of the contest. Yeah, it was a beautiful shot. Long left hook at the southpaw stance. He took it well. Like you said, Bracamonte, he's, he's proved time and time again. Very rarely does he get knocked out. It might get stopped on his feet, but he's tough as old boots. He really is. But that was a good round from Dempsey McKean. Picking the shots well. We see a bit more variation with a hook downstairs. He threw in a couple of uppercuts. It's always a, a good shot to throw when you're fighting a shorter man. Yeah, just saw the Argentinian hold on there as well. The signs of maybe being a little bit buzzed for the first time in the contest. Going to take a little more than that to get rid of him. Maybe two or three shots of that kind of ferocity and, and precision to put a real dent in him. But McKean certainly will feel that the contest is now very much in his hands as we enter the fourth round. He's up in the pace as well now, Dempsey McKean. Start this fourth round. Starting to put them together. Trying to really put a dent in Bracamonte. Yeah, I think he I think he um, realized he's hurt him and I think he's uh, he's up the pace now. Just in more of a rhythm, isn't he? Turning his man now, boxing around the center of the ring, holding his feet a little more too. Yeah. He's enjoying himself now. <laughs> Leads with the left hand that time, and these straight shots. Well, Bracamonte's kind of got the guard high and central, but they're getting through the middle. And he's only really able to just kind of muffle the impact of them. Another left hand to the body, just steps off to the right hand side. McKean controlling the distance, controlling the tempo, and in charge of the exchanges. And really, the firepower coming back from Bracamonte is becoming fewer. And farther between now, another yeah. big left hand lands. That was a good foot placement from Dempsey McKean. Then took his step, uh, step on the outside, and he threw a left hook instead of a straight right, uh, left straight down the middle. But I think getting that foot on the outside would would help Dempsey McKean to find that left hand. 
Him poking the jab out. He's found the distance quite well behind that jab. Warning McKean for just holding that lead uh, right hand out, just pinning him there. Some referees let it go, some don't. Bracamonte did complain about it a few minutes ago, and that he said was his, his third warning from the referee. Anything you'd like to see McKean doing, Joe? Um, to be honest, I think he's uh, doing everything that he should be doing. Um, the only point I'd I would pick up on his um, the circling. I think he should turn the the, the angle quicker, um, and more acuter, and get back to the centre and, and, and hold the centre. I'd, yeah. uh, I'd rather him do that than uh, be circling because um, he's burning up energy. Um, uh, his opponent, he's just walking him down, trying to and uh, trying to get that one shot off. So I think if he just turned the uh, uh, turned go get back to the centre and then he's got all that room behind him to just step back and um, draw, uh, pull him onto the shot. So. Absolutely. All of his best work's coming from the centre of the ring. Bracamonte trying to get close with 10 seconds on the clock in the fourth. Strands a little short left hook over the top there. McKean just has to hold on for a second. End of round four. Coming up next is the return of Takeley's six foot five light heavyweight Southport John Hedges. Going through the motions there with his coach Mark Tibbs. He's in action next against Alexander Nagolski. We've seen the debut of Chevron Clark after this as well. The larger team has produced some great fighters over the years, hasn't it? Carlos yeah. Monzon, Oscar Benavina, heavyweight slugger. And of course, you fought one of the greatest as well. I see you grinning at me then, and please mention Sergio Martinez. That, that wasn't. Uh, I still have his head up from it. He set that up lovely. <laughs> Yeah, it just pays me a fixed fee every week just to, to put some compliments in there. Well, I, I lost that fight. You did very well. <laughs> you did very well. <laughs> Cheers, <mate. laughs> but right now, Aero Bracamonte isn't doing too well against Dempsey McKean, struggling to close that gap and found himself on the end of long straight shots. Stand at a jab over the top of McKean's there. There's the right hand just a little low. Yeah, he's, he's not cutting the ring off. Is he, Bracamonte? He's following, you know, he's managing to push Dempsey McKean back. He's not cutting the ring down, but this is good work. This is where he has most of his success, McKean, when he's on the front foot, working behind that beautiful jab, following it up, head and body with that left hand. You can see him, uh, Bracamonte, Bracken, uh, getting um, really frustrated. That's a long jab from McKean. We've not given him the opportunity, has he, to, at this kind of distance, really dog it out with him and turn it into a bit of a street fight, which is his speciality, really. McKean's done the sensible thing. Kept it long, kept it disciplined. And Bracamonte has had, as we suspected that he might not, no answer for it. I think a nice uppercut after that long left, uh, right to the body would have gone down a treat. Where... Uh, you work them hooks to the body, the guard does come wide, so following the body shots up with an uppercut is always a good option. I think the steam has gone out of Bracamonte too, even when he does get close, the hands are laboured now. Yeah, they're heavy shots, but they're arm shots, and Dempsey can see him coming, can take the sting out of the shot. But again, just get backed up. A bit too easy for me. Just turn around, there's that uppercut. Beautiful shot, followed by a straight left down the middle. But that was a good little flurry of shots there from McKean. Right, 
It was a very good fight when he puts his hands together, McKean. Flashy combinations, head and body, good variation. Yeah, and he's progressed through the combinations at a sensible rate too. Hasn't let them go too early when the danger is potentially still there. Just waited until he knows that the uh, the threat has been well. It's, ne it's always ever present at heavyweight, but it's been pretty much as neutralised as it could be in this contest. And he's confident now that he can start putting the fours and the fives together. Yeah, I think he he knew he could um, catch him with them combinations early on, but he wasn't being too greedy. Um, and like you said, I think he's progressed through. The, the rounds, throwing them combinations, um, and he's, uh, he's throwing them at the right time now, so yeah. Well, we could see what Tony Sims was mimicking there, Darren, and you haven't forgot, you haven't forgotten what he taught you. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Look, when you go wide with a hook, especially around the body, you, you're bringing your arms back to protect yourself from their body shots, and that obviously opens up the guard, so the, the, the shot then is a shot straight down the middle, and when you're in that position where your knees are dipped and you're throwing the body shot, to come back up with an uppercut is the perfect shot, and I expect now Stepsy McKean to start trying to find that against the shorter man. So into the sixth round, McKean has uh, not lost one so far in full control at distance of Ariel Bracamonte, just landed that backhand to the body off the right hand to the head. Bracken wanted to try to punch off a slip there, but again, just stayed a little too long and walked into the combination of McKean straight back to centre ring where you guys have been asking for him to try and hold his ground. There's no, there's no value in, in trying to out-macho somebody who, who outweighs you by about 40 pounds in a contest like this. He, he's done the sensible thing. He's held his ground at sensible points, sat down on shots at the right time, Darren, but also not been too macho to, to give up ground, move off, and, and hold the space on the back foot. No, he, he's done the right thing. I just, you know, a little bit too much circling of the ring, but he has been smart with his attacks. I think there's another way that you, you could draw the lead out. That's the feint. We, we talk about this all the time. He's looking to trade Bracamonte, so a little feint to try and get him to to lead off and find the shots. That was a good head movement from Bracamonte. Moving on the outside, missing the, the shot from McKean, but not being able to fire back with anything. He's just one step behind Dempsey McKean at the minute. Well, throughout the contest, rather. Thudding shots to the body there. And a stiff jab behind it as well. Bracamonte just continues to inch forwards. Mixes up the, the pace and the power world, Dempsey McKean as well. It doesn't load up with everything. He'll, he'll poke the shots out. He'll tap them out, a little flurry, free, then he'll drop a he heavy one down to the body as he does there. That's something that can't really be taught. See, with, with some fighters, they, they either don't carry power, or if they do, they try and load up all the time. So it's good to mix it up. Speed and pace and power. Just the reddening now on the bridge of the nose and welts under both the eyes of Ariel Bracamonte. The marks of a consistent and sustained attack from Dempsey McKean over the best part of six rounds here at the O2. Will be more heavyweight action a little bit later on. Another man from, from Ipswich, but not Ipswich in Queensland, Ipswich in the UK. Fabio Wardley back in action against uh, six for seven Daniel Marks after nine months out of the ring for the British fighter. And like McKean, he too looking to prove that. He has credentials to mix it at world level in the coming months and years. Yeah, great combination. Um, yeah, uh, if Bracken Monte with um, a great, uh, was it one, two, right hook to the body. I'm sure he can back up with an uppercut too. 
much using that forearm there just to pin the guard as well. Little smart tricks on the inside. See it there again on the replay. Yeah, it just, you know, it strikes me as if Dempsey McKean's in there and he's enjoying himself. He's going through the motions. Not really out to bite down on his gum shield at all. You touched on it, Chris. Not taking any unnecessary risks. Just enjoying it. You know, there's not many times that you get to enjoy yourself in a boxing ring. It's tough, it's hard, it's horrible. Uh, and, and sometimes when things are going your way, you can sort of go into to autopilot and, and, and just, like I say, enjoy yourself. Yeah, you can see he's enjoying himself now. The first couple of rounds, um, you can see he was a bit wary of what's coming. But I think now he's gone on to, to what um, uh, his opponent's throwing back now. Yeah, it's been clinical and controlled as he knew it needed to be so really a keep busy fight for him that he was expected to control from start to finish and I guess he would have sensed in the early stages that he maybe wasn't going to get rid of his man and so had to just break him up as best he can and he is going through the gears here Dempsey McKean yeah he found the uh, I think it was the left uppercut there it was a lovely shot a short sharp shot inside Right hand from Bracamonte. Just throwing it off the slip to the left. Yeah, I'd like to see him throw that um, left up a couple a little bit more. He's um, every time he's through, he's landed. Just uh, getting a little careless there. Caught with a jab on the way in as well, McKean. Just nodded of nod of acknowledgement as Bracamonte just cuts him off there. Lands a couple of cuffing shots over the top. Then a right hand. There must have been many a fighter out there that have damaged their hands on Bracamonte's head. I said, yeah, he really is a tough nut. Yeah, many fighters that have made it a much more difficult night's work of him than Benson McKean has. He doesn't stop coming forward. Very hard to, to deter and put a dent in. And he is heavy-handed as well. Combination, right to the body, left to the body, followed up with a left uppercut. Really, really smart combination. Listening to the instructions of Tony Sims in the corner. How easy is it to, to hear Tony when you're in a ring? I know obviously now at this kind of stage of the night where there's very few in the arena and of course during the lockdown things were, were different but what about when the crowds are a little busier? Do you know what I don't know if Joe's the same or or other boxers are the same as me but I was in sync I'd been with Tony for so long that there were certain voices that I could hear in the crowd Tony obviously being one I'd always hear Mike Seltzer giving me a countdown with the clock and I'd hear my dad and my family but other than that it was muffled noise so I never struggled to hear the instructions of Tony in the corner Does that sound familiar to you Joe? Mm, it's spot on it's exactly the same as me Tony um, in my corner is the only voice I hear um, and I hear my mother and my father and a couple of people that are always there um, at ringside for my fight. So, um, yeah, that's spot on. Well, he's heeded the instructions really well through seven rounds. Dempsey McKean, one to go here on before the bell, before we see take this John Hedges in action. But uh, he's been in full control. He just took a couple of shots at the beginning of that round. Jab over the top, a couple of right hands off the, the little head slip from Bracamonte, just jabbing a little higher than McKean was because he was holding that right hand a little low. Yeah, uh, and that can happen, you know, like I said, the, the previous round looked like he's enjoying himself and you can switch off ever so slightly and that's the danger. And uh, Bracamonte did land a couple of shots and though there was no real sting in him, it would annoy him. He doesn't want to be taking any unnecessary shots. But then you see the good variation from McKean there. That was a nice, took his head off centre line and threw the left hand and previous to that working the body well, bringing the shots upstairs. Nice, you know, good, good stuff from McKean. I'm sure he'd love to get the stoppage, but so far so good. Well, plenty of the uh, the stable have come out to watch Connor Ben ringside. Craig Richards there as well, and uh, Felix Cash, who well made his return after a very difficult year last year, and by the skin of his teeth, got through a really really tough fight at. 
Alexandra Palace a, a couple of weeks ago, but we know he is better than that, and he'll be looking to show that later on this year. A nice one-two there from Dempsey McKean. He's around the side with the left hand that time. Bracamonte, just a little spring in his step, I guess, because he knows that he's got two and a half minutes to try and turn this fight on its head. He knows he's got the power to do so. It's just whether he can get into range as he just slings a right hand at anything he can. Yeah, just telegraphing everything. Doing the right thing, trying to back his man up and having success at times, but just not able to, to find the target. Just lack of speed and accuracy. Dempsey McGee again, just poking that jab out, head and body. Like I said at the, the top of this fight, very nimble for a big guy. Does move his feet well. It's yeah, not, it's not an effort, is it, Joe? You, you don't know? see many um, big fellas uh, like him moving the way he does. So, yeah, I think um, I think Tony and Peter um, they've got they've got someone special here. I think obviously he needs to, to have a couple of meaningful fights, and I think um, potentially down the line he can win a world title. Yeah, division in transition, isn't it? The the big three or four, whichever way you look at them. Usyk, Fury, Joshua, all coming to towards their their mid thirties now, and with chapters in their careers to to wrap up against each other in the next eighteen months to two years, we hope. And then there is another chasing pack on the way through, and he will be wanting to be part of this. He's left with the WBO, the IBF at the moment says he wants someone ahead of him to bolster his rankings and put him in a good position options ahead of him guys like Ajit Caboyel, Charles Martin but it's tough after that you need to get past somebody like Philip Ergovic, Tony Yoka, Luis Ortiz or maybe even Big Joe Joyce to clear a path towards a world title and well none of those really are are easy or favorable options so he's going to have to be the goods Darren there'll be no easy routes to a world title for him oh, look, uh, there's some real real big names there some real stars and future stars I think for, for me for McKean it's, it's about knowing when to plant your feet I think in the heavyweight division you've got to be able to hurt your your opponent you have to you, you, you're not going to be able to coast against these good guys so you need to know when to plant your feet and let the shots go with real meat and power to put a dent in these top class fighters and i've just seen a bit too much movement though he does move really really well i think at times he could have really put a dent in bracamonte but so far it's it's been a successful eight rounds win for mckean he would have learned a lot from it and onwards and upwards yeah, very comfortable win. Um, I think he'd be happy with the rounds, but also at the same time, I don't think he. Yeah, I think he would have wanted a stoppage towards the end, towards the end. So, yeah, it was a good win. Well, credit to Bracamonte, who didn't really have much of a, a reverse gear at any point in that contest. Kept marching forward, kept absorbing the shots and, and trying as he could, but he was overmatched in the end. And Dempsey McKean rolls on to 21 and 0 now. And it's that uh, a new crop coming through, the likes of Dubois, who he's been sparring with, Fabio Wardley, Sol Dakers, who will no doubt see Justin Tooney as well, Ivan Ditchko, and of course the United States, Jared Anderson, who we're here is coming over to spar with Tyson Fury in preparation for Dillian White, a good crop of fighters, and he is part of them at heavyweight. And there were some good exchanges early on, but he didn't take too many risks in the early stages, Darren. No, I mean, look, it was a similar pattern, I think, from first to last. I think we see Dempsey enjoy it by this stage. It was moving, but uh, put the shots together well, and lovely straight left down the middle there, started working the body well, and, and then starting to introduce the uppercut as the rounds went on. It, look, it was a good display, it really was. Good shot selection. Eight solid rounds under the belt against a real tough opponent who is always valued for money, always trying to push his opponent back, always trying to force the action, but that was good work to the body. The variation were, were, was impressive from Dempsey McKean, Chris. Yeah, I think Bracamonte may well be back to test one or two or other prospects in the coming months. So you can log that for sure. Um, but uh, well, the fighters are standing out by the ringside with the referee for the official particulars. So let's head over now, without further ado, to RMC, Joe Martinez. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after eight rounds, we go to the referee scorecard. Lee Every scores this contest 80-72 for your winner by unanimous decision. And still undefeated, Dempsey McKean! So Dempsey McKean moves on to 21-0 here. At the O2, he can settle in and enjoy the rest of the action tonight. We hope you can as well. Plenty to come here on the zone. Next up, 
John Hedges and Alexander Nagolsky in action before we see the debut of Olympian Chevron Clark at Cruiserweight. Take us through to 5 p.m. local time on the zone. Well, young Campbell Hatton will kick us off his sixth contest as a professional. And we'll see the likes of Fabio Wardley, Anthony Fowler, Jordan Gill boxing for the European title as well before Galaria Afai makes his professional debut too. Head of uh, the main event, Lawrence Okoli and Mikhail Sieslak. Well, that is the action still to come. Denzel McKean off the mark as a, as a professional. John Hedges and Chef Clark still to come here on Before the Belt. Thanks for your company wherever you're joining us. You're listening to Chris Lloyd alongside Darren Barker and Joe Cordina as well. And we're set to go in the next fight tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Six rounds in the light heavyweight division. First to make his way into the ring, fighting out of the red corner from Poland, Alexander Nagolski. Well, Alexander Nagolski, part of the Silesia boxing stable under Miroslav Butowicz in Poland. He's got a, a fight of his own to take care of here. He's three and one for another tall sound for him. Miroslav Kalarczyk in November and dealt with him pretty swiftly. But he has been stopped himself too. He was put away in two by a fighter called Arthur Gorski last summer. He's a little better on the front foot on the back. He looks like he can punch a little bit, but you'll know within the first minute that he's in with an opponent of better quality than he has been so far. And whether he can adjust to that level will determine any of the success that he has in this fight this afternoon. And his opponent ready to make his ring walk out of the blue corner from Tinkley, Essex, England. Here's the undefeated John Hedges. What a good reception for John Hedges. He watched his stablemate and friend Johnny Fisher take the roof off Alexandra Palace two weeks ago. And uh, some unfortunate weather this week. Nearly taken the roof off the O2, but thankfully... And he's still standing and the show can go on. He's had a decent run at it these last 18 months. Far from ideal for any young fighter turning professional amidst the, the throes of the pandemic. But he has made the most of it, boxing behind closed doors on the Boasi Kalic card. Likewise on Ben Vargas. He then went to Austria to fight on a Filip Ergovic undercard. And then finally had his first home outing in front of crowds against Big Ben Thomas in this very venue on the undercard of Cameron and McGee. Not a bad run at all for a man turning over in the midst of a pandemic. He's dealt with the pressures of being a young professional very, very well indeed and has improved already under Mark Tibbs. Will we see a level up again here tonight? Mark Tibbs certainly believes we will take these John Hedges. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we are set to go with six rounds. This in the light heavyweight division. Introducing to you first, fighting out of the red corner. Wearing black trunks, he weighed in officially 182.2 pounds. In three fights, his record stands at two victories, one defeat with one win coming by way of knockout from Bito, Poland. Here is Alexander Nagol. And across the ring, fighting out of the blue corner, stands his opponent. Wearing royal blue, trimmed in gold, he weighed in 183.9 pounds. In four bouts, he stands perfect with four victories and no defeats. Here's the undefeated light heavyweight from Tinkley, Essex, England. The gentleman, John Hedges! <laughs> and in charge of the action and scoring this bout, Chance Cookley. Okay, fellas, I've already spoke to you both. Keep them punches up. No use them yet. Just touch gloves. Good luck. The third. Six round a hit. The take, please, John Hedges, who boxed at an equally large light heavyweight in Ben Thomas last time out and just took a little bit of time to get to his man and, and break him up. He's had some good tests early on in his career. Jan Arden, a Czech fighter living in Manchester, who was very, very skillful. 
and scaled him back a little bit for two or three fights after that. As I mentioned, went over to Austria to fight Franny Radnich and looked good in that as well. His jab has improved, as you'd expect under Mark Tibbs and, of course, the great Jimmy Tibbs, a hallmark of, of that boxing style. And of course, still developing as a as a young man, 20 years of age, Darren, and uh, six foot five or, or thereabouts. He's kind of coming. They made this at 183 pounds, and of course, he'll box eventually at 175. But still, kind of playing with with the weight with him at the moment. Yeah, he is. Look, fundamentally, he's sound. He said there with Mark Tibbs and, and and learning heaps heaps from Mark. He's got a lot to like. He's just searching for that maturity. We, we all get it at different stages in life. I didn't get it until I was about 25. <laughs> so it, it takes time. Sometimes I still haven't gone, <laughs> But yeah, I think for John, as far as boxing is concerned, he's got every shot in the book. Classy fighter, very awkward south for tall and rangy. And I think when that maturity does finally hit, we'll see some very entertaining and exciting stoppages from, from John. That's a lovely shot. Uh, Straight left, straight down the middle. Nogloski took it well. Yeah, already a little red nose, and he just above the left eye. Nogolski just misses with the right hand, and well, he looks very small in there. And that isn't because he's undersized at, at the weight particularly, it's because John Hedges is uh, a real giant. Yeah, really stalking this man, isn't he? Already pushing Nogolski uh, back to the ropes, to the corner. Credit to the pole, he's moving his head well. Making it difficult for the hedges at times. That was a nice left to the body. And like I say, does mix it up well. Good variation. Always think you see the concentration on John Hedges' his face there. Trying to measure his man with a jab. Good variation with it. There's that left uppercut. It's that looping left keeps catching him. Nagolski looking just a little bit out of his depth. It just lands a Cuff in right hand, head just straight back on him though. Really turning through these shots early. They've been working with uh, an SSC coach called Sonny Cannon, who is in charge of all the Mark Tibbs fighters, Johnny Fisher included. They've got Ebony Bridges working with them at the moment. And as we've said, physically starting to feel the difference with Hedges on the pad. So, well, certainly looks to be the case from our ringside position here. A good first round from John Hedges. Yeah, you can say the best round of his. Uh pro career so far very accomplished there very positive on the front foot poking that jab out head and body and that right to the body was a beautiful shot Mikulski very red and around the face and breathing heavy already so I expect John Hedges to put the foot in the gas but yeah like I say and Joe pointed out also that looping left from Hedges was a beautiful shot very difficult, you know, when you've had four pro fights as well, not to, and you haven't had a stoppage, you're desperate to get a KO, a stoppage on the record, and you become a bit over eager, and you start biting the, down on the gum shield and taking unnecessary risks, but a lot more educated in his approach in this fight. Hedges was uh, trained by Sab Leo, who is uh, an amateur at the Hardison Boxing Club, just north of London, where Jordan Reynolds also trained uh, as an amateur. His first club is Wrexham from eight years of age. Had three fights then, 44 amateurs uh, and won 40 of them. Junior ABAs, GBs, Tri Nations, uh, and Joe, of course, you know the value of going and, and doing some of those tournaments, specifically across Scandinavia, in between the, the bigger internationals, can be good developers for you against a number of different styles. And he's had that experience. Yeah, well, he, he's, he was a great amateur. Um, I heard him, uh, obviously, he was a lot younger than me, but. When I was still an amateur, I always uh, heard his name pop up here and there every time I was going to a tournament or something. Um, but yeah, and he's obviously developed through getting the experience in them them small hall um, tournaments, um, in the GBs, the ABAs, all that sort of stuff. And um, I think he's just going to grow from strength to strength as a pro and uh, my kids. He's missing a couple of opportunities here to, to make the goal screen play. He's fainted, he's taken a little step back and Nagolski fell over the front foot and there was opportunities, but this is good boxing from John Hedges nonetheless. Really putting the shots together well, lovely straight left down the middle. Yeah, Beautiful on the, boxing. On the turn, wasn't he, Nagolski? And just the hands were, were out of position as well. 
He's in that kind of Philly shell stance when he turns. Perfect for that southpaw left hand. The hedge is struggling to miss here. Lands exactly the same shot again with a minute 30 on the clock. And Nagolski will be feeling the force of these start to accumulate. Really quick reactions as well from Hedges when you see in there, he throws two or three shots, a little sways out side of range or either side and fires straight back in. Really, really quick reflexes. Nice left uppercut there. Step out with a feet, really, really quick feet also. It's a good stuff from John Hedges. Great shots, putting our hands together well there. The flurry to the body, forced Nagolski to step off and just trying to box him into a corner. Nagolski just trying to, to find some space. It would have felt like quite a long round this for him. With 40 seconds to go in the second. Hedges just trying to cut that space off, find something else. Leads with the uppercut there from Southpaw. Follows up with two hard shots to the body. Really turning through these now. Credit to Nagolski, taking some shots. Around the side of the head, a couple of uppercuts have flown in. The body shots have been beautiful from John Hedges. He's still there, still trying, still moving. But he's not offering anything in return, is he? He can't miss with that looping backhand. That looping backhand is um, uh, finding the target every time. Nagolski's facial expression just betraying him at times. He's really felt the force of those shots and the, the volume of them too in that second round. John Hedges really starting to go through the gears with four rounds still to go on the clock. Yeah, good variation there, Chris. Throwing the uppercuts, shots raining in from all directions. That was a lovely time, yeah. straight left down the middle there. Landed them a couple of times, didn't he? And there he is, Chef Clark looking typically relaxed. Joe, did you spend any time on the, on the spot with Chef Clark? Yeah, Chef, um, it was towards the back end of uh, my time on the yeah. GB. He came on, um, he was always a character. Lovely fella. Um, I got a lot of time for Chef, I speak to him. Um, he probably phones me or I phone him uh, probably once, twice a month. Um, we have a good chat, so yeah, he's a great guy and, and a great fighter. He's, he's a handful, isn't he, from what I hear? Yeah, he is, um, he is a handful. He's, he's like a bull. Second zone, round three. <laughs> Chef Clark will be in action after this. In his uh, debut after that long-awaited Olympic tournament in Tokyo. And he came back with a record medal haul. And, uh, well, the star of the show was Galau Yafai, and he will be chief support this evening, making his debut over 10 rounds against Carlos Vado Bautista, dangerous Mexican fighter. Lots of action to come. All starts 5 o'clock local time on the zone around the world. And we look forward to you joining us wherever you are watching. So Mark seems in the corner there of John Hedges. They so used the faint, draw out that lead. And then make Nagolski pay sound advice. He is taking the bait, Nagolski. Good intelligent boxing behind the jab. He's mixed it up well. All that's missing now is the stoppage, is the knockout. Otherwise, boxing really well. I mean, look, not getting too carried away. There is going to be tougher tests for John Hedges. Nagolski not offering too much. But nonetheless, you can only beat who's in front of you, and he's, he's doing that really well at the minute, John Hedges. Really starting to dig the combinations in, Hedges, and be a bit of a bully here, that right hook under the elbow. He's starting to pick them up lovely. Yeah, he's up in the pace now, John. Again, Mark Tibbs, sound advice in the corner, saying, don't let him catch you. And when you're having things your own way, you can get a little bit greedy and switch off. Now and again, he will throw a big overhand right or left. The goal scares, he just misses with one there. All right, just took his head off the line there, Hedges. So he's still wise to what's coming back, and that's good to see defensive awareness in a fight that he's largely in control of. Again, just slipping that right hand and then comes back on the counter. Just stiffened Nagolski up with a left hand off the back of that combination. The 
have to give credit to, to Christian Churchy, who's matching a lot of these fights too, bringing opponents in, just understanding that the levels of the prospects that they're trying to, to match and manoeuvre and giving them a, a mixture of resistance and a little bit of offensive danger, just lessons for them, them to be learned. And a decent apprenticeship for, for John Hedges so far. He's letting his hands go now, trying to rough Nadolski up, push him back into the corner and trade fire with fire, and he feels comfortable doing so. And he's in full control. Tony Vistic just getting his hands wrapped ahead of the next contest against debutant Chevron Clark and he needs to be prepared for what's coming at him because the ball will be let out of the pen when that first bell goes. John Hedge is back at centre ring. Doing the right thing, John. You know, he's up the pace, but I just think he's just got to offer a little bit more now. Try and find the openings another way. I think, like I said, the feint, trying to draw the lead out and really fire back with a sharp left hand. The upper cart straight as he does there. I think he's opened down the body there. He's letting the hands go and. Nagolski in trouble, referee says enough, maybe a little yeah. early there, but John Hedges certainly won't complain, Nagolski has done, he started to wilt in the corner, maybe had a knee touch down, he would have got the eight count, but as he kind of bent over at the waist, the referee had decided that he'd had enough, and certainly he had seen enough, and no sooner had John Hedges started to put his foot down, than he waved it off, maybe a little early in that individual instance but really Darren it was in terms of the bigger picture of the fight one-way traffic all one-way traffic good boxing from John Hedges he, he upped the pace in the previous round really starting to go to work I was asking him to mix things up a little bit I think there was a couple of decent body shots went in as he stepped to his right good variation there and he'd be over the moon with that he'd be happy that he's got the stoppage on his record now um, yeah it was an accomplished performance Worked well. We see this last shot. It was a lovely left uppercut that Joe talked about, and then that left to the body as well. And he should have took a knee there. The goal ski he was he was hurt. He, he crouched down. And in all fairness, the the referee, I think he's done the right thing. He was uh, he was under pressure. He was uh, under the cosh, as they say. They were two good body shots followed up with a further shot to the body and the referee doing the right thing yeah joe you know he's, he's complaining there nagolski but when you're defending yourself yeah. like that, you, that that's not giving positive body language to the no, referee the it? referee done the right thing he jumped in you, you could see he didn't want to be in there from from that body language but um even if uh he gave him the benefit of the doubt and let it go on it was only going to end up one way and i think john would have got a stoppage um probably the next round so uh john hedges rolls on to five and out let's get the official announcement from joe martinez well, ladies and gentlemen, the end comes officially. 38 seconds, round number four. Referee Chaz Coakley puts a halt to the bout for your winner and still undefeated, the gentleman, John Hedges! So John Hedges in full control en route to the second stoppage of his career. Alexander Nagolski stopped in the corner. Yes, yes. And it was clinical, pretty composed, and he cranked up the pressure fairly early on in the fight, didn't he, Darren? Yeah. He, uh, he'll be happy with that. It was, uh, it was a good performance. Worked behind uh, a beautiful crisp jab. There was good variation with it, head and body. Looking for that looping uppercut and shot over the top, straight down the middle. It was a very good performance from John Hedges, and like I say, it's always nice when you get your first stoppage as a young novice professional. So 
Good job and onwards and upwards for John Hedges. That was a, a good start from him, clinical and well, parallels with Dempsey McKean, I suppose. He, he was a much taller fighter, Southpaw too, and he just boxed well at range. But I think the difference with this is John Hedges wasn't afraid to just get up close and, and mix it a little bit. Joe, I, I guess he felt comfortable enough early and he knew there was no real danger. Yeah, well, he's got a very uh, quick reaction, so I think when he was letting his hands go, he, he wasn't really worried about what was coming back. He's got good reactions, he was getting out the way of them. But, um, yeah, I, th I thought he was punch perfect at the times. And um, it was that, that looping body shot, and then he, he finished off with a right hook to the body, and he was catching him every single time. Yeah, smart boxing. It was that lovely left up at the start of the fit. He followed up, like you say, Joe, with that left to the body. Uh, and that was Curtin's correct stoppage, in my opinion. He was only going to end one way. So, yeah, an impressive fight for well, John he Hedges. Adds his uh, name to a list of ones to watch at super middleweight. And, well, wow. we'll be seeing one of the ones to watch wow. at heavyweight yeah. a little bit later on. Prospect Fabio Wardley returns to action here at the O2. What does one look for in a rising heavyweight? Power, excitement, command of the ring, hunger. Well, if that's what you're looking for, then look no further. Fabio Wardley is your one to watch. Fabio Wardley's power is no joke. He has a 92% knockout rate. When he does knock people out, he tends to do it in spectacular fashion. He's opening up on Simon Vanilli, and it is all over. With 12 fights, five victories, has come by the first round stoppage. One of those first round knockouts took place August 7, 2021, when Wardy took on veteran Nick Webb. He attacked full on in the last minute of the round and the ref waved it off after a barrage of punches knocked Webb down in the corner. Wow! Blink and you miss it, finish. Already the English heavyweight champion, 12 fights into his professional career. He's hungry for more. What do you want next? The British title. <laughs> Joe Joyce, can you um, let go of that now, please? And with his explosiveness and willingness to fight experience, tough opponents, the sky really is the limit for Fabio Wardley. Yeah, he certainly is one to watch, and he's been a bit of a revelation over the last couple of years. Fabio Wardy returns to action for the first time since August uh, in the summer, that first round knockout of Nick Webb in fight camp. He was carrying a couple of injuries into his last two or three fights, including the Valili fight where he won the English heavyweight title. Um, but Darren, a sensible decision for him at this stage of his career to just take a step back, let those injuries heal, uh, and come back fresh, repaired, and, and ready for what could be a, a big year for him. It, it will be a big year. I've been very impressed with Fabio. He's got a bit of everything. He's a very smart boxer. For someone that's had limited amateur experience, very, very impressive stuff. The way he thinks, he's a, a very smart, intelligent lad. He's got every shot in the book. He's, he, he can punch. And he's got this exciting edge to him as well. When he's hurt, he's dangerous. And, yeah, I think if you're, if you're a Fabio Wardley fan, you're in for a good ride. Yeah, Joe, we were saying that against Eric Molina, against Simon Valili, and against Nick Webb, as we just saw on the VT there. When he, when he has been buzzed because he's maybe switched off or just been caught with a good shot, that seems to be where he's at. He's most dangerous. Uh, have you been impressed with what you've seen of him so far? Yeah. Um, when I first seen him, I, I didn't see, uh, I didn't know too much about him, but um, I'm very, very impressed. I, I think it was when he, he, he boxed Molina. Um, he got hurt in that fight, and he came back straight away. He put a fight with fire, and, and he got the job done. And um, he's been getting the job done ever since, and he's he, he's going from strength to strength. And I think um, he's one to watch in the future. He'd be a, a, a wrecking machine. And against big Daniel Marks from the United States, he's been in with some experienced opposition uh, stateside. Uh, Joseph Parker, uh, Luis Ortiz, 
um, Charles Marty in as well. The, the best guys tend to have stopped him. He could be heavy handed. I think he's got something like 17 stoppages of his 20 wins, but he also tends to be quite vulnerable to punches early. And there's one thing that we, we do know about Fabio Wardley he, he can punch. He can, he can. Yeah, you're right with Marty. He, he's a banger, but he can get hurt. Okay, well, and here we go, ladies and gentlemen, six rounds Martinez. of action. This in the cruiserweight division. First to make his way to the ring, fighting out of the red corner from Croatia. Here is Tony Vicic. So we'll be seeing Fabio Wardley uh, a little bit later on on the main broadcast. It starts at five o'clock, and uh, this is the final contest of the night and before the belt. Tony Vicic. From Croatia, he's 20 and 29. He stopped himself by Simon Valili and uh, Fabio Turkey in the last three years. He went six though with Sam Hyde. He himself can be a little bit vulnerable and well, uh, it's the fighter of Chef Clark's pedigree as an amateur. And the way he will want to come out of the traps and make a statement, this could be a short night for him. And here is his opponent fighting out of the blue corner from Graves in Kent, England, making his professional debut. Siobhan Clark! Well, he was incredibly disappointed to come back as one of a very small handful of fighters that didn't win a medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games, but in the grand scheme of things, he did very, very well to get there. It was a a painstaking and arduous wait for the GB boxing team, a couple of whom in Galaxy Fine, Peter McGrail, qualified March 2020, didn't go to the games until August 21. And Jeff Clark persevered on, he's 31 years of age now. And he joins the professional ranks, done a lot of sparring over the years with Joshua Boazzi, his Olympic stable mate, who himself is looking to make headlines at light heavyweight in 2022. But like Galal Yafai, he just sensed that he may, at 31, need to get a move on here as well, Darren. Yeah, and he'll want to, I've no doubt. He would have seen these big shows that Matchroom are putting on and think, I want some of that, so I've no doubt he'll want to put his foot on the gas and get going. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, this bout is scheduled for six rounds in the cruiserweight division. Your referee scoring this fight and ruling the action inside the ring, Lee Every. Introducing to you first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing black trimmed and lime green. He weighed in 199 pounds. He enters the ring tonight for the 52nd time as a professional from Split, Croatia. Here is Tony Vicic. And across the ring, his opponent fighting out of the blue corner. Wearing black trunks, trimmed in gold. He weighed in 199.7 pounds. Tonight, he makes his professional debut, fighting out of and representing Graves and Kent, England. Here is Siobhan Clark! Okay, that's when I say stop, you stop boxing. When I say break, take a step back. Keep your hands up, protect yourself at all times. Good luck to you both. What a top, top amateur. Chef Clark beat Chris Bill and Smith in the ABA final 2016. It was a, an excellent fight. If you watch that fight, you'll, you'll see what you'll see tonight. He's not a big cruiserweight, but he is solid, strong, compact. Like a bull in a china shop, and he'll... Uh, Pushed many a bigger opponents back, and, and already he's on the front foot. That kind of peekaboo style, explosive, and uh, well, he's going to be, I think, very, very fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. And straight away out the blocks, you can see that hand speed, blistering hand speed for a cruiser. Like you say, not the biggest, but he is carved out of stone. He really is solid, and you can tell the way he sets himself up. There's good, solid base. That he carries power. Tony Viss is just trying to box his way off the ropes and give himself a little bit of space. I don't know that he's going to have much of it tonight. Lovely combination. Keep working, Pull 
And he's part of uh, Sam Mullins' team in Church's Boxing Club in London. He's trying to feint his way into range. Visage just lands a jab. Clark rounds a uh, right hand to the body. Already intelligent stuff from Chef Clark. Not head hunting, which a lot of debutants do do. He try to target the head and try and cause a dramatic knockout, but he's mixing up well. Head and body, smart jab to the body, trying to drop the hands and firing back with right hands to the head. Faints as well, it's intelligent stuff. This he's been in with the best in the world. Lost to David Nika at the Commonwealth Games semi final 2018. Lost a split to the Russian Evgeny Tyshenko, the former Olympic world and European champion, now pro, of course. That was in Helsinki the year before. And he's been in with the likes of Eris Landis Savon, Muslim Gazi Magomedov, beat Peter Mullenberg as an experienced, strong amateur from the Netherlands. And that experience is still in good stead. A right hand around the side drops Tony Visic with under 40 seconds in the first round. Well, he complained it was around the back of the head. We'll have to get another look at it. Looks pretty clean from first viewing. Bishev Clark has first blood hit in the first round of his career. Right hand again follows up, and Visic is hurt again, and he hangs on. Yes, yeah, good pressure. It's a good. Assault from Chev Clark. He's enjoying himself. He's putting them together, head and body, moving the head. This is beautiful boxing. Spiteful finish from Chev Clark. Well, you only get one debut. You only get one opening round on your debut, and that was a pretty good one. Yeah, he'd be happy with that. Little struck back to the blue corner. After putting in a fantastic display in that first round, it really, really was impressive stuff. Yeah, I was impressed with that first round then. Um, and as you're going back to, to his amateur days and naming some of the fighters he's been in with and some of the ones he's lost against, but they're all some of the best fighters in the world um, and have been for the last 10, 15 years in the amateurs. So I think he's only lost to the best. And, um, yeah, you'll see some great things coming from Trevor. Yeah, he really put together well, didn't he? Angles, and it was that first shot there. If you just see it round... I wouldn't quite say the back of the head, but there's no doubt, no question well, about that Well, that, that was definitely not around the back of the head. <laughs> yeah. that, that was, I mean, that was the on the point, point of the chin there, yeah. but... Yeah, he enjoyed himself there, really, really putting them together well. Impressive first round. And he is uh, kind of a front foot counter puncher is the best way to describe him. When, it, when he is in that groove, just bobbing and weaving into range and, and throwing off the, the head movement, he is uh, a, a joy to watch and... Been working the body subtly in between his combinations too. And already had Tony Visage in some trouble towards the end of that first round. Six scheduled. Not only does he faint with his hands, he faints with his feet. You see there? Always keeping his opponent thinking all the time. Is he going to mount an attack? And then he doesn't and tries to draw out the lead that he does there. And opts not to throw the counter, but throws two right hands, head and body. Really is impressive. And Joe, I don't know if you found this. Of course, when you, you've been boxing at such a high pace in the amateurs and the reflexes of the opponents are so fast, the first three or four opponents, I imagine it's almost like you're, you're boxing in slow motion at times, isn't it? Yeah, well, um, you feel like that, but when you watch it back, you're still going at a pace. But um, yeah, it's, it's completely different. Boxing, amateur boxing, and pro boxing, completely different things. So it'll take you four or five fights to get settled down and, and, and get into the groove of things. But it seems here that Chev, um, he's, he's settled in perfectly. It feel like he's in the Matrix, Chef Clark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think he knows he's got him hurt now, so I think he's trying to press him a little bit more. It's just going to be tough now at times when your, your opponent goes into survival mode to find the opening, so he's got to continue with those feints. Plenty of variation, but so far looking very impressive. Stepping off, creating lovely angles, firing up the middle. This is just trying to keep the hands high and tight, but he will feel the force of these getting through. Yeah, he's trying to take the second round, but a right hand around the side. And down goes Visits. I don't know if he's going to survive that. 
That was a heavy, heavy blow. He'll do well to make it to his feet, and it is all over in the second round. What a debut for Chevron Clark. Very impressive. I mean, you can't do any better than that. <laughs> that, that was spot on, that was spiteful, that, that was aggressive. That had the, the show real finish as well. That really was a good display from Chef Clark. Welcome to the pros. Welcome to the pros indeed. And well, a good benchmark on the debut. I always glance across the ring at Eddie Hearn, who is here at the very start of the show, always watches every single fight of the night. And you get an idea from his facial expression of what he thinks, and he is very, very excited about what he's seen. They're very honest, <laughs> most of the time, Eddie. Uh, and look, he'll be looking for his new stars coming through, and he'll be looking at Chef Clark there thinking, look, I, I, I've got one there, uh, I've got a real gem. But there's going to be tougher tests, but there's a, there was a bit of everything from Chef Clark there. There really was. I mean, the good variation, quick hands, took a little right hook in there, but that was a beautiful shot, it really was, showing Real speed, power, education in his work. Just reminded me a little bit of uh, the, the Boatsy Bolotnik's final knockdown when he just was trying to exit on the ropes and he just got caught with a right hand as he was drifting to his right-hand side and he collapsed in a similar fashion. The pair of them are, are very good friends. I know Joshua Boatsy will be watching this from his training camp as well. And well, Chef Clark off the mark in emphatic fashion here at the O2 Arena. No doubt some big nights for him to come and let's get the official results with our MC, Joe Martinez. Ladies and gentlemen, the end comes at the official time. Two minutes, one second, round number two. Referee Lee Every reaches a count of 10 for your winner in his professional debut, recording a knockout tonight in front of his home country of England, Siobhan Kwan! Well, as good a debut as you could have asked for for Chevron Clark and well, respect to Tony Visage, but he was under the cosh when the offers we knew he would be. But well, sometimes these opponents can be really, really tough and difficult to unlock. We found clinical, precise shots, stiff jabs to the body early, and well, everything with, with purpose. And the way he changed angles when he was in the corner to create openings was impressive. And no doubt Sam Mullins and the team at Churchill's will be extremely happy. His motto is level up. And, well, no doubt we'll see him level up in the months to come. He wants to be active, he wants to be busy. And no doubt, you can see Eddie Hearn in the ring with him there. He will sense that he has something very, very special on his hands. Yeah, no doubt he has. Very, very impressive debut. Really was. I, I was a little worried after the first round that this might go into his shell. And he did slightly, but Chev Clark still found ways uh, to find the openings and showing that tremendous power. I was really impressed with the feet, the, the, the fainting with the feet, the hands, and it was, yeah, it was just spot on. Good variation, wasn't head hunting like a lot of debutants do. See the shots raining in from all angles. That was the first knockdown, lovely shot, complaining it ran to the back of the head. Well, it certainly wasn't, it was on the point of the chin. And again, it was just more shots raining in, trying to fire back with his own shots, to see, but not having the opportunity and credit to this he got up twice and they were two heavy shots and back to work he went straight down the middle there the variation again was impressive this is dropping his head trying to make it difficult for Chev Clark to land cleanly but he always found a way to find the opening beautiful shot there as he was leaning forward and it was a tremendous first round and it was here that I felt Visit will go into his shell and he did but Clark found the ways to find the openings and this last shot was a peach. Look at that as Visit's is sort of swaying out of range. It's always horrible when you see a fighter go down like he did. The knee, leg almost bending. You see he sort of pivots his man onto the rope, takes the right hand and right over the top to the left shoulder of Visit. Beautiful shot, beautiful way to, to open your professional career. And Joe, after a, a frustrating couple of years having to wait so long for, for the Olympic Games, things not quite panning out for him. I, I know that's a familiar situation to, to what you found yourself in in 2016. How much of a relief will this be getting off the mark and, and having such a successful debut? Yeah, well, this is no secret. He's got talent um, and you've just seen it. Um, 
two heavy knockdowns. He got he got all the all the punches in the book. He got the angles. He got the footwork. He comes forward. He can fight. There's no um, there's no getting away from that. But yeah, I was in a, same, a similar position and and coming into my debut, I wanted to impress. Um, second fight, I wanted to impress, and it was just fight by fight. You just want to keep leveling up, as as Chef would say, um, and I think he's doing that. Absolutely. Well, plenty of action to come on the zone over the next few weeks. Uh, what a replacement Julio Cesar Martinez has proved to be Chocolatito next weekend in San Diego. The two of them clash. That is going to be fireworks. And then after a sublime performance against Yukan at Fight Camp last year, Lee Wood holds the WVA regular version of the world title and he takes on Ireland's Mick Conlon in Nottingham. That is going to be a fabulous main event. And then, of course, a very, very tricky contest for Virgil Ortiz Jr. He's been some wrecking ball in the division, wiping out most in his path. But hey, what, Darren? Michael McKinson is not going to be as easy to hit as some of his opponents so far. I mean, he's a nightmare. He is the problem, like his nickname suggests. I mean, he moves so well, good variation with his movement, and he, he, he's so tricky. But Ortiz, what a fighter. He really is. 18 and 0, 18 knockouts. He's a real handful. And then can Josh Warrington reclaim the IBF world title? Who'd have thought in 2022 that Kiko Martinez would be the belt holder? But he is, and on March 26th, they will meet in Leeds to do battle again. Martinez, the belt holder, Warrington, the challenger. Then Ryan Garcia back in action after a year and a half out, and good to see he faces Manuel Targo in... Uh, they're in Texas, aren't they, Darren? I believe. Yeah, so, yeah. So April the 9th and then the big one, the fight of the year in terms of women's boxing, potentially the biggest women's fight of all time. Unified world titles on the line when Katie Taylor takes on Amanda Serrano in New York, April 30th, all live and exclusive on the zone. And if we needed to remind you, this fight, Joe Cordina, Dimitri Bivol, could he be Canelo's trickiest test in the last few years, do you think? Yeah, of course. He's a he's a big guy. Um, he can fight. He can box. He can do it all. Um, he's had a great amateur uh, uh, um, uh, career, and I think yeah, he could cause Canelo problems. But Canelo is um, is that step above, um, that level above, and he's proved it time and time again. And I think uh, when he gets into a rhythm, he's hard to take out. And I think it's only a matter of time before Canelo will get hold of him, and I think he will uh, do the job on him. Darren. Where do you rate Bivol's chances of, of causing what most people would see as an upset here? But surely this has to be close to a 50-50 fight, doesn't it? Well, look, he, he's a very good fighter. But then there, there's good fighters, there's very good fighters, then there's elite-level fighters. Canelo, I think, is at a level above elite level. I mean, you're talking absolute superstar, and I just feel... Look, it's, it's Bivol's more comfortable weight category. Canelo's obviously coming up, but for me, he's just an absolute beast, and like, I only see a Canelo win. Well, we will find out when those two meet live on the zone uh, around the world. And plenty of action, though, still to come here tonight. We open the show with Campbell Hatton against uh, Joe Ducker, a lightweight contest. Fabio Wardley, who we just saw a little promo of, will meet Daniel Marks in heavyweight action in the second contest of the night. Anthony Fowler will then make his middleweight debut against Lukas Maciek from Poland. Big opportunity for Jordan Gill as he challenges for the European featherweight world title against the champion Kareem Guerfi. And then the 10-round debut of Olympic gold medalist Galau Yafai against Mexican Carlos Vado Bautista. All teases up very nicely for a dangerous and no foregone conclusion main event as Lawrence Ciccoli makes the second defence of his WBO world cruiserweight title against Poland's Mikhail Cieslak. Maris Brilis will be joining our broadcast team in the studio watching on if Lawrence Ciccoli is victorious. He could well be looking at a unification with Brilis later on this year. But much to attend to before then, a big, big main event here at the O2 in London. Well, it's been a pleasure to have your company. We'll be going live in just over 25 minutes' time, local time, on the zone. So do tune in then from myself, from Darren Barker, and from Joe Cordina at the conference desk. Thank you for your company on Before the Bell, and we will see you in just over half an hour's time. <laughs>